listen to me. My daughter has been kidnapped. He's the only chance I've got of finding her. If he sees me or I lose him, they'll kill her. What I need you to do is follow him, tell him you're crazy about him. Try to bring him over here and I will do the rest. And you can go back to your normal life. Got it? No. Please help me. You're the only chance I've got. In the 80s, there, first of all, there weren't those many black women doing film. And she was kind of a, a fully realized character. And she had the female lead. It may sound simple, that was a big deal. As soon as you're getting into a bigger-than-life character that Arnold was playing, and we're really trying to make Arnold work in a contemporary setting, which he really had not been in, and we really talked about slowly, slowly moving the bar, we thought what would mitigate all this would be somebody who noticed how preposterous it was. I set up the tragedy and the real reality, and then he gets to take the air out of it. I was the laurel to his hearty in that, you know, I'm worried and, and the more I did that, the better his um, smug but funny, you know, flippant comments, the better they would ricochet and bounce off. You steal my car, you rip the seat out, you kidnap me, you ask me to help you find your daughter, which I very kindly do, and then you get me involved in a shootout where people are dying and there's blood spurting all over the place, and then I watch you rip a phone booth out of the wall, swing from the ceiling like Tarzan, and then there's a cop that's gonna shoot you and I stay you and he starts chasing me are you gonna tell me what's going on or what no i just imagined her as somebody who might fold her socks imagine being really persnickety and organized and then having arnold schwarzenegger kidnap you <laughs> You're right. Wait for me. I think that's why the film has held up far better than other, you know, action-packed films of the same era because it's clear that the film knows on a certain level that it's over the top and is sort of playing a game and winking, you know, at the audience. I have to remind you, Sally, <laughs> this is my week off. Ah. The whole plot was unique. The setup of the film is why people bought the script even. People remember. I mean, that kind of writing is essential to have that kind of long-standing cult following of a movie. They're remembering the experience of it through words and the things they saw on screen. Any carry-on luggage? Just him. And then I think also it gave the bad guys a humanity, you know? You know what I like best? What's that? The price. Hey! Wait a minute! I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a well thought out sequence. But the important thing that drives whenever you do this is the villains have to be deadly serious. In the pecking order of the movie, you've got your desk heavy, who's the guy running the show, General Arius, Dan Hedaya, and then you have your heavy, Vernon Wells. Bennett, I thought you were... Dead. You thought wrong. Do you know what today is, Matrix? Day. Every good film has to have a good antagonist. You know, to get a, to make a hero a hero, you have to have a villain of equal intensity. And the thing about it is that no villain thinks he's a villain. To play a villain correctly, you have to believe that what you're doing is right. How much they're paying your penance? They offered me a hundred grand. Do you want to know something? When I found out I'd get my hands on you, I said I'd do it for nothing. Hey, hold it. I'll be back, Bennett. John! I'll be ready, John. You know, we've gone away from that, that having having the, the wonderful character of, of the, the hero and the villain. You know, now your villains become terribly wishy-washy. Mine is a scary bad guy. You know, you know that if, if you confront me, I'm going to break your neck and, and, you know, suck out your brains. When I met him the first day, I said, God, how is he going to pull off playing a mean guy? He's so nice. But when, when you say action, 
he can be so mean that I look at him and I say, wait a minute, what's happening here? You know, and he comes with this knife at me and he starts fighting and all those kind of things. And he's incredible the way he gets into it. And uh, so we work very well together. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and he's scary. I don't need the girl. I don't need the girl! I don't need the gun, John. I can beat you. I don't need no gun! When the scene was over, Arnold remarked to Mark Lester, keep him away from me. It was very funny because you know, he was afraid I was actually going to cut his throat, I think. I, I just went. And it, that was the start of a great relationship. Your training, Matrix. And then you have, like, the dog heavies. And, uh, and the dog heavy, this goes back, this is an old Hollywood nomenclature, like maybe he'd kick a dog going across the street or like, you know, be mean to the bartender. You know, I got something I'd really like to give you. I'm not interested. Oh, you don't know what you're missing. From here, it looks like a nightmare. Would you please leave me alone? You fucking whore. There wasn't much for him to do except die as you worked your way up to the main villain. So that's why David Patrick Kelly is in the movie and he can be funny because he's like never supposed to be the clear physical threat. He's half Arnold's size. Remember, Sally, when I promised to kill you last? That's right, Matrix, you did. I lied. What'd you do with Sally? I let him go. It makes me feel great that people are still excited about a movie this, this long ago, because I myself is, am a movie buff. The part that, you know, to this day I find sort of amusing is that people come up to me and they say The Commando is their favorite movie. The only thing I'd like to say is that I am probably one of the few people that has kicked the governor of California's butt and got away with it. I'm happy that it's, it's, it's got a life like this. Who knew? Remember, Bennett knows where you live. Welcome back, John. So glad you could make it.